Michael Saylor, the CEO of MicroStrategy, made a billion dollar bet on Bitcoin last year. MicroStrategy has now acquired over 70,000 Bitcoins, making it one of the largest public holders of Bitcoin in the world. So it's a gift. Once in a thousand years, do you actually see the invention of a fundamentally new thing? This is our once in a thousand year opportunity. You get to buy into it early. In August 2020, MicroStrategy confirmed it had made Bitcoin its primary treasury reserve asset. Then in September, the firm doubled down by purchasing an additional $175 million of BTC. Saylor touted his commitment to Bitcoin on Twitter by advising Elon Musk to convert Tesla's balance sheet into Bitcoin. A month later, Tesla did just that. However, Saylor wasn't always a staunch Bitcoin supporter. In 2013, he claimed Bitcoin's days are numbered and compared Bitcoin with online gambling. Times have changed since then, along with the opinions of large corporations. Saylor's advocacy of Bitcoin in 2020 earned him a spot in Cointelegraph's top 100 notable people in blockchain. In fact, he took fourth place. So why does the fourth most important person in blockchain claim his company will hold Bitcoin for the next 100 years? Watch this interview to find out. But before that, don't forget to subscribe to our channel. Austin Davis, co-founder of Community Electricity, sat down with Michael Saylor to bring you this interview. Take it away, Austin. What's up, everybody? Austin Davis here interviewing the, the uh, famed Michael Saylor. We're going to be chatting about Bitcoin and about uh, success and failure and glory and all the above. How are you doing, Michael? I'm well, thank you. Amazing. Um, that, so last time I got to chat with you, I, I wanted to ask you a question, but I kind of forgot. What is that boat behind you? Is this the uh, Queen Anne's Revenge we're looking at here? What, what boat is that? You know, it's actually, it's a 19th century antique model, handmade of a 17th century galleon. Ah. So it's, a, it's an, old, uh, an old galleon and, and uh, it was made very intricately in about 150 years ago by hand. And it's, uh, it's kind of a work of art. And so I keep it around. It's one of my mascots. It's very motivational. Since you mentioned, you know, history and, and that thing seems to like has a, has a lot of history to it. Um, you're, you're a history buff, right? You uh, you've, uh, have a background in, in uh, the history of science, I believe. Is that right? Yeah, I got a degree in the history of science at MIT. So uh, what, what draws you to history? Because that must have started at an early age, right? I, I always loved history, you know, from, uh, from the point I was in secondary school. And I just think it's fascinating to read about uh, the exploits of humanity. What happened? Why did it happen? How did it all turn out? Hopefully there's some, there's some good lessons in there that we can draw upon for the modern era. Absolutely. Yeah. And, um, and you also studied engineering, right? Yeah, spaceship design. I Amazing. studied, uh, you know, astronautical engineering. So uh, uh -huh. I, at MIT, you know, there are a lot of engineers, but I, but I thought it was really nice to be able to blend um, the study of the humanities and sociology and economics and politics and history of science, which is all about what happens to civilizations when you have new technology introduced into them. What happens when we invent x-rays or railroads or communications or airplanes or roads in general? And, and they all have a profound impact. So if you're just the engineer and you don't consider the consequences economically or politically, then you only get half the picture. And I, I think it's very interesting to see the interplay of the two. So that, that leads me to one of the, uh, the interesting topics of today, Bitcoin, right? It's Bitcoin week in Miami. Um, so there's a lot going on around Bitcoin around the world. You're obviously a huge advocate of it these days and you believe in it, which is amazing um, to, to have someone in your position who, uh, who actually has done the research and uh, decided it was a good uh, investment and a good uh, secure, a way to secure the, the future. Um, so, so that leads me to the kind of tying engineering to this. So I love it when you uh, kind of bring the thermodynamic principles and the laws of thermodynamics into uh, explanations of Bitcoin and why you think it's uh, a very sound money because of that. So can you can you touch on that a little bit um, on thermodynamics and Bitcoin? Sure. I mean, I think that a, a lot of the times the Bitcoin story is, is told through um, an economic lens or a spiritual lens or a mathematical 
lens or sometimes a financial lens. And, you know, in the extreme, it gets called an uncorrelated speculative asset, which I hate. Yeah. Right. Uh, I think the story that needs to be told much more is that Bitcoin is a masterpiece of monetary engineering. And there was no class in monetary engineering at MIT, but we studied servo mechanisms and cybernetics. And the principles of control system uh, are, are critical for aerospace engineering. The plane won't fly if you don't have stability. Avionics are all about control. Um, in electronics, you know, there's plenty of examples of control systems. And uh, in every other engineering discipline, people understand uh, the principles of controls and thermodynamics, uh, you know, the study of energy as it manifests itself in heat and work, right, is critical to making any machine work. And, um, you know, when I think about Bitcoin, I think, well, first of all, it's the first successfully engineered monetary network in the history of the world. One day they'll probably have a, a class or they'll have a degree in monetary engineering at universities uh, next to chemical engineering or, or electrical engineering. It makes sense. Um, what is money? Uh, well, I, I think most people don't ask the question. I think money is monetary energy. I think it's the apex energy. And as soon as you understand money to be energy, then it stands to reason that a monetary system that applies the, the principle of conservation of energy <laughs> is a pretty good idea. If I create a bathtub with, a, you know, with the sink open, it doesn't work. If I have a swimming pool with a leak in it, it doesn't work. If I have a ship with a leak, it doesn't work. A plane with a leak doesn't work. Electrical engineering systems you know, and power grids with short circuits don't work. In fact, nothing in the engineering world, aqueducts don't work right? Bridges with a leak in them don't work. So every engineer knows you have to apply the laws of thermodynamics. You need to apply conservation of energy. If you're a mathematician, you'd call it arithmetic, right? The, the rule that <laughs> right. says that if I add nine plus nine, it better add up to 18 because on the day that it adds up to 19, some horrific thing is going to happen, right? Uh, so once you understand money is monetary energy and you understand Bitcoin is a monetary energy network, then uh, you start to appreciate the fact that it either does or does not respect the laws of thermodynamics. If it doesn't, then that means that uh, it has a leak. Uh, you know, the, the term, the colloquial term for a leak in, uh, in monetary economics is inflation. Inflation is the leak. And, you know, inflation is, is uh, a hole, you know, <laughs> in the container and in the reactor and, and uh, your water, your electrical power, your uh, reservoirs, your hydraulic systems, your pneumatic systems, your fuselages and your hulls, they all fail. Everybody dies if you don't have conservation of energy. And so um, I... You know, I respect Bitcoin because A, it's a monetary system. B, it's engineered uh, in a conservative fashion. And the classic definition of conservative would be uh, derived from conservation of energy. If I give you 10 items, will you give me back the 10 items or will you change the number to 11 or downgrade it to nine? And if you're not conservative in your appreciation of energy, then no machine works, nothing works. That's right. Yeah, I, I wish uh, more of our economic policies would, would, would learn from uh, the principles of thermodynamics as well, right? I don't think, I don't think printing, uh, what was it, between 23 and 26%, I believe, in 2020, we printed of the entire US dollar uh, amount ever created. That's pretty, that's pretty insane, right? Because it goes back to what you were talking about, the expanding monetary supply. Um, your salaries are staying roughly the same. The monetary supply is expanding. Your purchasing power of your dollar is shrinking. Most people don't even think about that. They just spend their dollars. And, you know, maybe if you're not holding the dollars, it doesn't matter as much, but it, it's, that's the problem. They try to, <laughs> I guess the powers that be want to hold everybody in that position um, to some degree so that uh, they can keep printing. So that kind of takes me to uh, 
to scarcity a bit because uh, based on those principles, there's only 21 million Bitcoins that will ever be created. Um, now, I had some, some folks yesterday asking questions about the scarcity of that, you know, what happens as we approach that? You know, in your mind, what happens as we approach 2141 when the last Bitcoins are being mined? Um, what does the world look like, um, you know, at, at, regarding Bitcoin and the use of it at that point? Well, I think scarcity uh, just means integrity. It means math mathematical purity or it means conservation of energy. And if you have integrity in any engineered body or reactor, that just means that you're not going to be leaking pressure or leaking fluids. It's a closed system thermodynamically or an adiabatic system. And of course, what you learn in engineering is you can't solve for a non-adiabatic system. There's no solution because it's uncertain as to how much fluid or how much mass will enter or leave the system that makes it impossible. So scarcity really, uh, to, to my mind, just means we've decided to create a conservative adiabatic system such that we can solve an economic problem. Um, you know, once we've done that, what do I think will happen? I, I think that uh, the system, uh, you know, the Bitcoin monetary network will gracefully evolve into a monetary network that's funded by transaction fees. And the transaction fees will finance the miners to provide transaction processing power and security. Uh, and it'll be all market driven. And as the network gets more broadly distributed, the demand for scarce bandwidth on the network will increase and the transaction fees will increase and the, and, uh, and the transaction size and monetary value will increase. We'll end up moving large blocks of money, million dollars, 10 million, 100 million, whatever the fiat currency is, it'll be large blocks with high transaction fees. And then all the small blocks will move off chain in, uh, in, in essence, Bitcoin banks like PayPal or Square or Binance or Coinbase, which are in essence Bitcoin banks that are mm -hmm. moving hundreds of millions of small transactions off chain, yeah. or maybe in Lightning, if you will. And, sure. uh, and, and it'll be great. It'll be fine. So do you think that, uh, you know, let's say invoices will be thought of in Bitcoin in the future instead of right now, it's, I guess, globally accepted that the US dollar is a good comparative uh, currency um, when you're invoicing. Do you think that we'll start to switch because it's so it, universal, if you, you will? Know, like I, the what, I, what I think is there's going to be five, let's say today there's $500 trillion worth of monetary energy money in the system. And it's divided between currencies like the euro and the dollar. It's divided uh, in tangible hard assets, maybe real estate, trophy assets, art, gold, silver, Bitcoin. And then there's a portion of it that's sitting in bonds and stocks. And um, uh, Bitcoin is going to grow from that $600 billion asset to become a $10 trillion asset like gold, then it will subsume gold and it'll become a 20, 30, 40, 50, a hundred trillion dollar asset. And that'll be the core of the monetary planet, if you will. Right now, we're still going to have Picasso and people will have value for their Picasso paintings. You're still going to have your diamonds you're wearing and your gold rings and you're going to have your beach house because you're going to want your beach house. If you're going to own stocks, you're going to own them because you love the companies, because you wanted to make an investment in the company because you love the company. You think it's going to go up faster than the rate of monetary expansion. I think that the currencies will be mandated by the governments. As long as there's a United States government, there'll be a dollar and the dollar will be legal tender. And, uh, and people will buy things and sell things transactionally in dollars. And the reason why is because the IRS gives the dollar currency tax treatment. If I give you $100 a year ago, and if uh, the dollar appreciates against the peso over the next mm -hmm. year, and it's worth 10 million gazillion pesos, and you <laughs> give me the $100, the yeah. US government is not going to charge you a capital gains tax, right? So it makes sense for you to move dollars as currency because there's no tax obligation. But right. if I give you a, a Bitcoin a year ago, and the Bitcoin is now worth, it was worth 10,000 a year ago, and it's worth 100,000 next year, and you give it back to me, you're going to owe the federal government $35,000 in capital gain. You're not giving me the Bitcoin. Keep the Bitcoin. <laughs> give me the right. dollars, right? Yeah. You want to yeah. give me, you want to give me money? 
borrow against the Bitcoin, fund in the Bitcoin currency, and then give me the dollars, or convert something into dollars. And that's your, so your, your currency is dictated by the government. You know, you start your own island, Austin, you can have your own, you know, you can spend Satoshis on your own island if you want to. But as long as there's the EU central bank or the US or the whatever, their tax authority will determine the currency based upon whatever they designate as currency. If the IRS had designated Bitcoin as currency, there would be no capital gain to move that back and forth. When the IRS designated as property, it implies it's digital gold. You should treat it like gold. You should buy it and hold it forever. And then my advice to you would be to borrow against it tax-free, never pay capital gains, never take an operating income. You know, if you must sell it, I don't think you should because it's the highest quality property in the world and in the history of the world. We never invented a technically more thermodynamically sound, pure monetary property than this, right? This right. should be the container for the money you're going to hold for your grandchildren. This is it. Better than gold, better than a stock, better than real estate, better than a Picasso, even if you love a Picasso, right? Right. So I think that I think Bitcoin is property in cyberspace. And I think that currencies aren't going away as long as governments are with us. And I'm going to hope the government will stick around because I think there's <laughs> some good things about having a government. And a when the, the dust settles, you're going to have maybe a hundred trillion dollars worth of pure monetary energy in Bitcoin. You're going to have a hundred trillion dollars worth of stocks or 200 trillion and there'll be pri price discovery. The value of the stock should decrease until the returns are expected risk adjusted returns on the stocks are rational. You would expect the value of bonds would decrease such that the coupon on the bond is rational price. That is called price discovery returning to those markets. You would expect that the value of gold will decrease and or will start to equalize to its ornamental value. What is it worth to you as an ornament? What's your art worth as an ornament? What is your beach house worth for your value and use? And then there'll be a layer of cash and dollars and euros and pesos and yen and yuan that will circulate around. And that layer of cash will probably not hold value because we know we're going to keep inflating it and. You know, you ever calculate in the one? I do. It's like it's like a ten thousand one to the dollar, and it's it's yeah. measured in billions of one. It is, you know, it used to be a peso was one peso to the dollar, and you know, it's shooting up to one hundred and forty Argentine pesos to the dollar on the black market right now. So, eventually, the, the currencies will fall, but they'll be used for day to day transactions. And if you're wise, your wealth preservation strategy would be put all your money into Bitcoin, don't ever sell it, and then borrow against it. You know, and if you borrow against 10% of your Bitcoin, and then your living expenses don't go up more than 10% a year, and if Bitcoin goes up 20% a year, your debt to equity ratio will fall forever. You will never yep. pay capital gains tax. You will never have income tax. Yep. You just need a bank that, that handles Bitcoin, and the banking and be sector for Bitcoin is evolving right now. So also earlier, you mentioned something about scarcity, um, tying it to, you know, thinking about precious metals, right? Like, yeah, in the near term, they're, they're probably going to do good and go up. But long term, there's a non-trivial effort going into asteroid mining right now. One person gets it right. One group of people get that right. And they start bringing payloads back. You know, let's say they, they hire Elon Musk and say, you've got a lot of assets up there. Help me get this stuff from A to B. And all of a sudden, we've got a steady stream 24 hours bringing precious metals to the planet. You know, there's more platinum on one asteroid than we've ever mined on planet Earth. So I think precious metals long term don't make sense uh, forever. But Bitcoin, you know, could get thousands of years out of it. Right. Depends on what happens to humanity, I guess. Look, the, I mean, the problem is if I want a system of mathematics or engineering, it needs to be based on arithmetic, ma mathematical integrity or conservation of energy. It can't be based upon an analog approximation of integrity. Like, it's really hard for us to find rocks, and we found 21 rocks. And we're going to, as long as nobody finds a 22nd rock, then we're going to add up to 21. It yeah. can't be an approximation, which is what gold is. It needs to be, a, it needs to be an exact thing. So Bitcoin, arithmetic is a protocol. You know, Bitcoin is a protocol 
English is a protocol, a language is a protocol. You know, <clears throat> if everybody in the world agrees to communicate with the English language a thousand years from now, we'll still be using the English language and we'll be using it because billions of people agree to communicate in the English language, right? If everybody agrees to move their money around in Bitcoin, a thousand years from now, we'll be storing our money in Bitcoin. So worrying about whether we find some more silver or some more gold, right, is, is kind of silly, right? It's like the truth is we just should abandon commodity monies in the same way that you abandon the abacus or, I don't know, I'm trying to imagine like caveman with like 47 rocks in the dirt. And they're like, this is our way of keeping track of what we have. And at night, there's someone standing guard over the 42 rocks to make sure that someone doesn't accidentally drop a 43rd rock and destabilize yeah. the power structure. And it's like, that's, you know, it's, a, it's an open system, not a closed system. It's defective. And it's kind of like just changing the rules of arithmetic. Your bridge is going to crash. Your ship yeah. is going to sink. Your airplane is going to crash and burn. So I, I don't even think about asteroid mining because it's such a silly notion to think that I'm going to save my money in gold and hope that no one mines an asteroid. It's about as stupid as saying, I'm going to save my money in gold beads in sub-Saharan Africa and hope that nobody with a ship shows up with more gold, with more glass beads, right? Right. It's like the glass bead money or like the seashell money. As long as no one treks over to the to the beach and finds more seashells, I'll be a rich man. It's right. Like, well, good luck with that. I mean, that didn't work with any civilization that I can remember. It's about as dumb as the giant stone coin of the Yap people. And so <laughs> if you're saving your money in gold, it's the modern equivalent of saving your money in the giant stone coin of the Yap people. And as long as no Westerner and a ship shows up with other stones, yeah, it just you're going to be fine. You think yeah. about it, you know, and the asteroid mining thing is the equivalent of what if someone shows up with a ship with glass beads or seashells or oh, it's, it's stone exactly the same coins thing. Yeah. and it crashes our economy? Yeah. And the answer is maybe if you happen. actually had computers and arithmetic, you should have used the computers and arithmetic to base your economy on and not stone coins of the Yap people. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, you mentioned something earlier about, um, you know, money being a kind of a language uh, and I've kind of kind of agree with that. I've said that over the years. Um, and it just dawned on me like, man, the guys who invented Esperanto, I forgot who it was um, back in the day and tried to create a universal language, right? That everybody could easily learn and use. Bitcoin kind of is that new thing, right? Everybody can use it. It doesn't take much to understand it, uh, at least not under to understand how to use it. To understand it takes a lot of brain power and time really to understand it um, if you look back. But but at a high level to use it and understand how to use it doesn't take any, it just, it's pretty simple. Um, especially since new, more and more companies are supporting it. Um, so at any rate, I don't want to dive into that too much, but I thought that was interesting. Um, well, could, look, oh, I'll say on that subject, the people that are skeptical of Bitcoin, they generally, they don't have historical appreciation of protocols. Like mm -hmm. they think like, well, like I even see a famous hedge fund manager saying, well, Bitcoin is something and someone will invent a better version of it one day to replace it. And it's like, well, dude, do you not realize that railroad tracks are that width because Roman war chariots were that width and 2,000 years have gone by and nobody managed to change the railroad gauge? <laughs> right. Yeah. Good luck with that. We still have, yeah. I mean, Latin lasted 800 years. The yeah. English language is circulating. We're using an Arabic arithmetic. How, trace those numbers back and try to figure out how come so, no one changed the system of arithmetic yeah. You know, and why don't you look at the power plug in the wall, look at the power supply and the voltage and the prongs, and then ask yourself, how hard would it be to change that? And then why don't you go change like, you know, pounds and inches for the metric system? Because people have been talking about doing that since I was a kid in first grade. Yeah. Protocols last, TCP IP last. English language last, all of these technical protocols and weights and measures. We have things that go back thousands and thousands and thousands of years. They go back 2000 years before Christ. And we're yeah. still stuck with certain of these protocols because once they get in to the civilization, 
and everybody agrees that they're going to use those protocols, you know, it's a basic common sense idea. Even Warren Buffett articulated it, but he didn't understand it as a protocol. When he says brands have value, the reason Coca-Cola as a brand has value is because a billion people on the planet have in their head that the word Coke means something safe I can drink that tastes fizzy and good. And when a billion people have it in their head, if you were to nuke all factories, all distribution, the entire supply of Coca-Cola, everything on earth, the idea of Coca-Cola in, in the head of a billion people has value. And you have to murder the billion people and start again with the civilization to replace right. the brand with something else. And so the Bitcoin brand and the protocol for moving money around is something which very well can go for hundreds of years, if not thousands of years. And once people realize that, they realize, no, it's not about inventing something better. There's, you know, any number of people came up with the better railroad car that was 12 inches wider. Good luck with putting that on a hundred billion dollars worth of rails, railroad tracks and bribing 10,000 politicians to let you rebuild the railroad so that you can run your rail car with an extra one foot of width. It doesn't work. Do you think there's a future of decentralized mining for Bitcoin where everybody, you're not going to make a ton of money, but you'll be supporting the network, right? You know, the virtual power plant would be the centralized thing that is maybe earning the most money, but individuals could be running nodes as, as a lot already are. I think it's most likely that it's going to scale up and it'll be containerized, like people building these big shipping containers that are full of miners yep. that have thousands of miners in a container that they can ship anywhere on earth and just drop yep. on a pad. And I think mm -hmm. it'll migrate in these containers to the edge of the power network. It's going to yep. migrate to the place where you're not going to be stealing power from Manhattan where you're competing against human beings because human beings are going to bid more for the power. Like exactly. it's worth, for example, you would pay 10 cents a kilowatt hour. You would pay a dollar a kilowatt hour. You would pay $10 a kilowatt hour. If the, if your choice was to do it yourself or do it with the mule yeah. right? or buy the yeah. electricity. So, so human beings are always going to pay more for the power. You have to go to places where there is power that and there are no human beings places where the humans can't consume all the power and mm -hmm. where the power is either uh, it's either stranded where we have to keep producing it we can't stop producing it and there are no human beings or there's no other uses of the power and then presumably you know it'll be some combination of i find renewable power you know in a place that's very cold so my cooling is free what yeah. you really want is re infinitely renewable power stranded in a place where it's freezing and, and I don't have to pay to cool the thing. I drop the and there are no people there and I run a long line there and I just mine Bitcoin and, and uh, you know, offsetting that will be these containers will be moving because politicians will be changing the laws and they'll be seizing them. <laughs> they'll yeah. be taxing. They'll either tax them They'll outlaw them, they'll seize them, or they'll leave you alone, and the rates will change. And so I, you know, I don't think it makes a lot of sense to build fixed mining capacity because eventually the politicians will tax you and, yeah. or, or the power will go up. If you want to play this game, you have to have access to the equipment. You have to be able to spin up the data center quickly, but you have to find stranded power energy that there for which there is no better use where you can buy it in essence buy it for effectively zero right, right? near near zero a penny is good zero is better yeah, of course right and and two yeah. cents is okay but ultimately anybody on earth can compete and mining against you and so you're going to be competing against nation states that will give away the power for free yeah. in order to generate the hard currency and so, you know, you really got to, you almost got to be thinking about, will nature give me free cooling? So I got to go to the Arctic Circle. Can I find right. free energy with a hydroelectric power supply that was accidentally built? Can I find a political government that won't tax me out of existence? 
And then can I keep uh, first generation or, or current generation SHA-256 yeah. hash power? I don't know. We'll see. But, yeah. um, you know, it's, it's going to be a very dynamic business. Very dynamic, it, very competitive business. And it's good for Bitcoin. But it's like if I had $100 million right now, I wouldn't invest it in mining. I'd invest it in Bitcoin. Right. It just Bitcoin makes is the monopoly <laughs> digital right. dominant network mining is you choosing to compete against everybody on earth. Right. But you yeah. better have a built in edge. You know, if you're Intel and you build chips or if you're Amazon and you have data centers, or if you, if you're Iceland and you already own a bunch of hydroelectric or geothermal power that, you yeah. know, you're, you know, if you're Bitmain and you're you're using your first gen and selling all of your second gens to, to you know whatever you know vice versa you're you're selling the the new models but you've already used the old models and you're just rotating them something like that like if you're first in line at Bitmain or one of the miners right um, so yeah that that's interesting I just wanted to touch on that and get your perspective on uh, Bitcoin mining. Um, all right, so so we can wrap, but uh, before we do any any uh, motivational words for folks that. Uh, should get into uh, to Bitcoin. I know you've been great at calling people out, you know, top level people that, that should get in, but in general to the public, any uh, motivational words of uh, why they should pay attention to this thing called Bitcoin? Look, I think Bitcoin's a bank in cyberspace. It's, you know, and your choices are you save your money in a traditional conventional fiat bank and you're going to watch your purchasing power dwindle down over the next decade to the point where it'll buy nothing. <laughs> or... Yeah. You can gamble in the stock market that's maybe rigged against you, <laughs> you know, and if it's not rigged against you, then then you'll be buying companies that are generating cash flows and fiat currency that is collapsing in value. So even if you think you've avoided the problem of currency weakening of storing your money in a bank, you haven't really because if you're buying real estate bonds or stocks that also generate fiat currency and that currency is collapsing in value, you've got the same problem. It's a, now you have a fiat derivative. Or you can uh, save your monetary energy, save your purchasing power and your wealth in Bitcoin, which is not a fiat derivative that is not collapsing in value, that is going to appreciate against all these other currencies as they collapse in value. And you don't have to gamble on whether or not Apple will ship a good iPhone 14 or, you know, the next generation of this product or that product or this service or what that government will do to this company and what that CEO will do. All very complicated, anxiety inducing. Bitcoin is a simple thing, right? It's, a, yep. it's You're buying into a thermodynamically sound engineered monetary network, the first workable monetary network in the history of the world or first digital monetary network in the history of the world you know it's a, it's a gift once in a thousand years do you actually see the invention of a fundamentally new thing this is our once in a thousand year opportunity you get to buy into it early you know what would it be like if you own 10 percent of all the electricity that was ever going to be pumped or what if you could buy one percent of all the running water that's ever going to be pumped, right? That's what this is, right? It's 1% right. of all the fire that's ever going yeah. to be lit. You For have sure. a chance to buy a percentage of, of the future. Seems like a no brainer to me. Thank you for, uh, for being the way you are and taking the moves that you're doing. Uh, Cause I know that you're probably facing opposition, but you know, what's right. So thanks for uh, sticking true to yourself. Yep. Thanks for hosting <laughs> me, Austin. All thanks so much, Michael. We'll talk to you next time. Yep. Bye-bye.